Let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the organizing team of Janki Devi Memorial College and Mahatma Gandhi Government College, I, Ankandhar, welcome all of you to the fourth session of day two of our national seminar, Tribes, Learning and Unlearning Tribal Culture. The session is on visual and literary representations. I welcome the chair of our session, Professor Sanjay Hazarika, who has kindly agreed to join us. Professor Hazarika is the International Director of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. He is a multifaceted scholar, journalist, filmmaker, policy analyst, and human rights advocate. Strangers No More, New Narratives from the Northeast is his most recent publication. Professor Hazarika was the founder director of Center for Northeast Studies and Policy Research, Jama Milia Islamia. He is the managing trustee of CNS, which runs the pioneering boat clinics on the Brahmaputra in Assam in partnership with the National Health Mission in Assam. He was recently appointed as a member of the consultative group for Northeast State Division, Niti Aayog, Government of India. Welcome, sir. So we have six paper presentations today. Uh, and um, sh uh, should I just begin with uh, them one by one? Well, <clears throat> just a second. Just give me a minute because I'm looking at the papers and uh, I think what I'll do is I'll make a few opening remarks and then you can uh, introduce the speakers because um, the presenters because uh, what you need to tell me is how much time each presenter has because I must warn our presenters that I'm a very I'm not liked as a chair because I'm pretty harsh so okay. you'll have to be, stick to your time I'll tell you one minute before uh, or two minutes before your time is up to basically wrap up and then um, you'll have to wrap up when I ask you to because I won't stop we'll just go to the next presentation so <clears throat> Ankan, if you could also uh, do one thing if you could kindly um, whatsapp me or send me an email on the lineup of speakers because the paper presenters are not given in any 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 line at least in the email that i've seen but okay, uh, before you do that let me just say that i'd like to thank dr bhardwaj and Ms. kala for inviting me and my former colleague uh, arania uh, who is now a colleague of yours at yanki Devi. um so i'm i'm very very happy to be here because it's on the discussion and the papers are on an area that in a way that I've worked on uh, because I am a writer, uh, but I write fiction. Uh, I don't write fiction. Uh, I write, uh, I think, reasonably researched uh, books. I uh, produce, I script and produce films which are based on some of those books and some of the issues in the Northeast. And um, what is, deeply encouraging to me first as uh, somebody who started the first northeast center in a central university in jamia in 2009 is to see that there's a proliferation of scholarship on different aspects of the northeast not the same old stuff you know not violence and conflict and ethnic mobilization but different nuances of people uh, sharing their points of view, understanding the world, people the world understanding them. And I think that's very significant because the written word, uh, the, what we write, uh, lives on uh, even after we are not there. It also uh, is a magical reflection of the times in which we live uh, and the challenges we face and often um, because uh, you are all scholars and uh, therefore um, extremely knowledgeable uh, a lot of it is work which is original uh, 
And uh, I think uh, what is happening now in scholarship is that uh, both in India, not just the Northeast, but in India across the world, people are using new tools in this digital age to communicate, reach out, share their learning. So it is not just a pedagogical tool for echo chambers and classrooms, but it is goes outside the classroom because that is where it really counts. Um, so uh, among the uh, among the um, matters that have been very encouraging is the new spate of writing by uh, younger young new scholars of of the region. But I know this is about tribes, and there'll be other presenters, not just of the Northeast, which is an area I work on. Uh, and uh, I would only say that both in fiction and in prose, in film and in theater, uh, the stories of the, not just the tribes, but the peoples, the peoplehood of the region and other communities, ethnic communities, is beginning to be heard, read, and seen, all three. Uh, because our narratives must be heard, read, and seen. It's not just them being read. And uh, I was in a discussion earlier today, uh, uh, yesterday actually, I was chairing, uh, uh, I was uh, speaking at a session on uh, something completely different to what you're discussing on custodial violence and deaths in custody. And I said to them that it's very important for you, and I say as an editor and a journalist and a writer and a researcher, it's very important for us to reach out to the wider world, not just to write in our own confined spaces, because if you don't reach out to the wider world, it will not know of the work, the unique work that each of you is doing. And whether it is in writing for what you may call the mainstream media, but a lot of people read that, you know, and more and more scholars, whether it's historians like Ram Guha uh, or uh, somebody uh, like Rajmohan Gandhi, uh, people that we all know of, these people are increasingly writing for the, what I call the metro media. So I think this is very important that as we, uh, fashion and shape our own lives and our work in the areas in which we specialize, we continue the process of reaching out and connecting to larger communities so that they are informed of the work that is being done and uh, appreciate it and understand it and uh, are better uh, able to engage with the issues on which we, uh, we uh, research and, and uh, teach. So I'll stop here and I'll come to Ankan. Ankan, you have to tell me how many minutes for each person. Yeah, so for each speaker has 10 minutes. And uh, as you said, you can inform them a minute before. I'll give before. them two minutes. And yeah. I might just extend it by one minute, so. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah. And uh, there are six papers. Uh, I have sent you the list of the paper presenters. The first presenter is Priyanka Desai. Then we have Jisha Ponachan. Uh, then Aisha Femin. Uh, then Basundhara Gautam. Then Grace Hanzu. And then Zoya Ribello. So, should I, uh, a few instructions. Um, the audience can type their questions in the chat box. And uh, we can take the questions from there after the presentations. Or you can discuss the presentations and then we can take have the question answer down as you find it convenient. I, I think the best thing would be to have the six presentations. So we'll have two presentations and then Q&A for both presentations and then move to the third and fourth and similarly Q&A. How much time is there for the Q&A? Uh, it's up to, up, up to the questions that we receive. I mean, sir. We have to finish, wind up the session by four. Yeah, okay, because I have to also go to another meeting at four. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, please, uh, uh, let's so have the first, the first speak, presenter. Yeah. So the first presenter is Priyanka Nayak Desai, who is from Parvati by Chogule College of Arts and Science. 
Her paper is titled The Goan Subaltern, Tracing the Lives of Kunbis in Goa Through Konkani Cinema. Over to you, Priyanka. Uh, thank you, sir. I'll be sharing my screen. Please let me know if it is visible. Is it visible? No, Priyanka, you have to play the presentation. Uncle, I don't think Priyanka is here anymore right now in this. Okay, she has she lost connection. I think she's back. I just saw her. Priyanka, are you there? Uh, yes. Sorry for the inconvenience. I had some network issue. So, would you like to go second in, uh, just to figure out your presentation? Are you able to see my screen? Yeah. yeah. I... Yes. Okay. Thank you. Shall I proceed? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Priyanka Naigdesai. I'm currently pursuing my master's degree at Palatibai Chogule College of Arts and Science. And my topic is the Govan Subaltern, tracing the life of Kunbis in Goa through Konkani cinema. Antonio Gramsci, an Italian Marxist philosopher, coined the word term subaltern to describe the cultural hegemony that excludes and displaces specific people and social group from the socio-economic institution of society. In the Indian context, this term subaltern can be used to refer to any person or group holding subordinate position. That could be because of race, class, gender, religion, ethnicity, etc. One such community that is seen in Goa is the Govan Kunbis. Kunbis are Aboriginal people of Goa and they are mostly found in Salse Taluka. They claim themselves to be the original inhabitant of Konkan. These indigenous people live among nature and work effortlessly to make their living. But a lot of urban settlers perceive them to be exotic, primitive and backward community because of the stereotype associated with them. Modern society, with the help of government officials, have changed forest laws in their favor and robbed their natural homeland from them. This has made the Kunbis powerless, marginalized, community in Goa. These are the objectives of my paper. The paper attempts to explore the life of Kunbis in Goa through Konkani cinema with a special focus on Paltarcha Munis, the man beyond the bridge. It also highlights the major issues faced by the member of this tribe like social, religious, education and health related. The researcher shall also recommend some suggestions that might help to overcome the challenges faced by the member of this community. Other documentaries, as well as web services like Kunbi Village, the Govan tribal demand the right to livelihood, and the Govan village stuck in dark would be used to support my argument. Uh, portrayal of Kunbis in the Pultatsa Munas. The movie Pultatsa Munas is a tale of romance between a forest officer and a mentally ill woman. but. It also has a deeper underlining message of exploitation of Kunbi community. Okay, can I ask you to, hi uh, Priyanka, can you, can you make it this full screen? Because you, uh, uh, you just go to the icon on the right side, you know, where the screens are. Otherwise you have the, your screen split by the small things and so on. Uh, I just zoomed it. Is that fine? No, it's not a question of zooming. Ankan, can you just help her uh, explain to her how, how you do? Uh, yeah, yeah, so you had just gone to all the... All scholars should know how to do full screen. On the right bo bottom of the screen, the one which shows... Uh, yeah, yeah, this one. Please speak. So like Slide this. show? Yes. Okay. 
okay. So I think there's a problem with this PPT. Sorry. I mean, uh, your slides are still. I mean, it's not showing each slide. I mean, you you can we can see your screen actually. I think you have to do full screen. Can you do full screen? Are you not able to see my slides? Priyanka, it is not the question whether we can see your slides or not. You need to, if you're going to present to conferences, you need to do how to learn how to do full screen. Okay. That's one of the first things. This has been around for about 20 years. Uh, and you try the icon which is on the top left, the one here above home. Uh, yes. Just try this. Okay, it says start from the beginning. Uh, or try I'm... F5. Somebody suggested F5. Try pressing F5. Maybe the full screen will come. Uh, it doesn't work. Oh, anyway, let's let's go on. Otherwise, we'll just keep wasting time on this. Yes, please go ahead with the portrayal of Kunbi's in uh, Walter Dacho Munis. If one focuses more on culture and ritual, then it tends to become more anthropological film or a kind of documentary on the lives of tribe. It renders a vivid image of Kunbi community in Goa. They are also shown living by hunting and gathering of fruits, tubers, edible root, which is true. Though a lot of kunbis in contemporary time have taken other occupation, but many others are still, uh, still relying on hunting and gathering. The director also introduces us to the slightly different dialect of Konkani, which is used by this kunbi. This dialect does not have its own script. All the kun uh, Kunbi characters in the film communicate amongst each other using this dialect. The traditional attire of a Kunbi man comprises of a leon cloth known as Kasti uh, with a blanket draped over his shoulder. The woman is seen draping her sari in a distinctive style wherein she ties a knot on her shoulder using her uh, Kunbi pallu. The youths from this community are acceptable to this chain and are usually seen wearing pants and shirt. In the film, we see that the director has depicted the older generation in traditional attire and the youths in shirt and pants. That is because he wanted to show that they are open to accept the changes. It is just that we need to approach to them. The film highlights that these tribes are rich in culture and tradition. It depicts the celebration of Shigmo, which is one of the well-known festival in this community. They celebrate this festival after the rich golden harvest of Pedi to share their happiness. In fact, all their festivals have some intense connection with nature. In the web series, namely Kunbi village, we see that the Kunbi community uh, performing traditional dances, namely Dhalo, Godemudni, and Fugudyo. They are uh, either performed on religious and social event or to take a break from their everyday schedule. While uh, things around are changing so fast because of urbanization, but this community are always seen trying to preserve their culture and tradition. The film also draws our attention to the fact that the Kunbis have strong religious belief. This kind of religious belief is called animistic, which means that they believe in existence of spirit separable from the body. The Kunbis are of the opinion that the soul of a man stays alive after the death and enters into the another body irrespective of biological group or family, whom they refer to as ghost. They are God-fearing people and have strong belief in supernatural things. In the movie, the leader from, uh, from this community says, Quote, unquote. Temple decides our principle, ethics, and morals. They believe that the day they will stop constructing temples, that day their entire system will collapse. In the movie, the old aunt 
tells vinayak who is the central character of the movie that people only behave differently when they are possessed by ghost so when they notice someone behave, behaving differently they take that person to the exorcist instead of taking him to the doctor because uh, this belief is ingrained in them many kunbis are dependent on forest to meet their um, uh, health care requirement these are some of the issues which the kunbi community uh, suffers uh, though they are dependent uh, though a lot of uh, kunbis are still dependent on forest to their to, for their health care services that is mainly because the health care facilities available in this area in the area the health, they do not have a proper health care service available in the area where they reside their ability to get involved in indigenous medicine and magical practice have been productive in past but in the present era the prevention and cure of illness and diseases requires specialized medical treatment and consultation with professionals many could be Priyanka, you need to wrap up you've already taken eight minutes okay you need to okay. conclude in the next one sorry for interrupting no, no, no. Let her, because I interrupted her and she spent one minute trying to figure out this full screen. So in all fairness to her, and we started late. So yeah, yeah. I, I she, did she, she, she has, uh, she has, you have three minutes left, uh, Priyanka. So. Right. Okay. Many of them do not have access to formal education as the schools are uh, always set away from the area from where they, say, uh, where they reside. Since many kundis are poor, uh, education appears to be luxury to them. Some of the kundis uh, residential area also do not have proper power supply. In Pulturza Munis, the director did not convey this message through dialogues, but the audience can feel it through the scene. Firelight is the only source of light in this concrete dense forest. Uh, in the documentary, the Govan tribal demands right to livelihood. They talk about the struggle of Kunbi after urbanization. Through it, we can understand that before urbanization, the Kunbis have enjoyed unhindered right of ownership and management over natural resources. But with the development of industrialization in Goa and the discovery of mineral and other resources in tribal inhabited area, these pockets were thrown open to the outsiders and the state control replaced the tribal control. As a result of this, the Kunbis lost the ownership of the right which they had for several generations. This acquisition of land by the government and the private investors led to large-scale displacement of Kunbi population. Uh, in, the, in an interview with the director, which I had conduct, uh, conducted for this paper, he said, quote, unquote, there are many things that we urban settlers can learn from our tribe. Love towards environment, hard work, discipline, honesty, simplicity, kindness, celebration, art for the love of it, etc. People in urban area are becoming more and more secluded. An open worldview is missing in our life which I would like to cherish in tribal community. I would like to conclude my presentation by putting forth some suggestion that could help to improve the condition of this community. The only strategy for the development of Kunvi community is by improving the quality of life, especially in the field of education and health. Uh, education should be provided to them in their regional language and in their cultural background. That would help them to learn the things faster. Regional, uh, religious dog dogmatism and superstition should be removed through implementation of scientific education. They should be provided with medicine, safe water, nutritious food, clean and properly ventilated area. The government officials who are posted in tribal area often misuse the ignorance of tribal people and exploit them. Hence, the government should appoint officials who are convergent with the tribal culture and who intend to improve the condition of tribal people. Uh, the urban settlers also need to be more sensitive towards the Kurmi tribe. This would help to improve the uh, situation of Kumbi community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before you, uh, Ankan, before you call the second uh, presenter, who is also from the same college, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I have uh, uh, something which I wanted to mention. I, I want to thank uh, uh, Priyanka for uh, mentioning this 
community, which I frankly did not know much about. Uh, I'd heard about it because I go to Goa quite, quite often, as do probably many of us. But just a question which is not related to the paper, where exactly is the college in Goa? Is it in Pana? Are you in Panaji or is it Manasha? in Marga. In Marga. Okay. Yeah, Marga. Okay. I know Marga. Yeah. Okay. Can we have the next paper? Yeah. And, so, uh, I would request whoever is presenting, unless you have uh, connectivity issues, please put on your video. Everybody would like to see the person, not just hear the voice. Thank you. Yes, a request to all the presenters to please switch on your videos. So next, Jisha Ponnachan from Parvati Bai Chogoli College of Arts and Science, and her paper is titled Liberal Goddesses and Explore Exploration of Feminine Agency in Tribal Hindu Mythology. Over to you, uh, Jisha. Yes, thank you, sir. I unfortunately wouldn't be able to put up my video because there is a network issue, and I'm really sorry for that. I will be presenting my screen uh, now. Do tell me if you can see it in full screen or not. Is it uh, is it visible now? Yes. All right. So I'm good to go. Uh, a very good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jisha Ponachin. I am a MA English uh, postgraduate student. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, this is very interesting. Yes, do tell your colleague how to do full screen. Okay, it's just a light thing. Thank you. Go ahead. All right, sir. Noted. Uh, I am a student of Parvati Bai Chogle College of Arts and Science. Uh, the title of my paper is Liberal Goddesses and Exploration of Feminine Agency in Tribal Hindu Mythology. Uh, it's very well known that the tribal version of our pan-Indian epics may differ in terms of language, region, and performative traditions. But a common feature that I notice in all of these is that they not only challenge the existing hegemonies, but they are also more inclusive and provide a more nuanced understanding of the epics as seen through the tribal perspectives. So the objectives of my paper are as follows to explore how tribal pan-Indian mythologies such as Ramayana and Mahabharata differ from standardized mythological literature, to, to analyze how tribal mythologies present characters such as Draupadi and Sita as having the ability to express their own feminine agency, and to examine how tribal creation myths play a significant role in the development of a positive male-female power dynamics. So the primary sources for my paper were two different texts. First is Painted Words, an anthology of tribal literature that's edited by G. N. Devi. And uh, the version that I've picked is the Billy Mahabharata, which is documented by Bhagwandas Patil. The other text is Living Ramayanas, exploring the plurality of the epic in Vayanad and the world, uh, written by Aziz Taruana. And the tribe that I would be focusing on is the Adiya tribe uh, and the Adiya Ramayana. So the Bills are India's second largest tribal population, and they're mentioned in the ancient Hindu epics, making them one of India's most ancient tribes. For them, the Mahabharata is crucially significant and is presented in very discontinuous episodes rather than as one continuous narrative. So it's worth noting here that the recital of these tales are not just limited to the male performers, but also include recitals by female storytellers. A compilation of these Dungri Bill version of the Mahabharata has been documented by Bhagwandas Patil in his book, book called Bilo Ka Bharat. And the overall narrative of the tales is very similar to Vyasa's version of the epic, but the characters and their characteristics have been altered based on Bill's worldview. So women in Billy Bhabharata are not defined by their relationship with the males, but they're rather more empowered. So the, we are right now looking at the representation of Draupadi in the Billy Mahabharata. And she is not simply looked at as the wife of the five Pandava brothers or the one who was humiliated at the hands of the Kauravas. She is portrayed as a woman with a mind of her own who has power even over her husbands. So there is an instance uh, in the tale when Vasuki, the serpent god, wants to make love to her despite knowing that Draupadi is married. So you see that in response, Draupadi is hurling curses at him and repeatedly offending him. She later proceeds to make love with him in front of her husband, Arjuna. And in the process, she's not portrayed as a victim, but rather as a consenting sexual partner who wants to teach her husband a lesson for being arrogant towards her. 
Now, the peculiarity of uh, Beale's Mahabharata is that it does not observe a woman's sexual practices or desires as a disgrace. So sexual longing is seen as very primal and instinctual, and there's no stigma attached to it. Moreover, uh, Draupadi's depiction breaks the age-old patriarchal notion that a woman can have sexual relations only with a husband or whoever he selects for her. So she holds authority within the dynamics of their male-female interactions. And later it is described that Arjuna worships her as Adi Shakti, the primordial goddess or the creatrix of the universe. So this is a position that's very uh, rarely given to any woman. Our next tribe is the Adiya tribe, and uh, they comprise tribal inhabitants that belong to this culturally rich Vayana district of Kerala. And they believe that the Ramayana seems to have occurred in and around Vayana area. Their version of the Ramayana is a very far cry from Valmiki's Ramayana. And the most notable feature of these tales is their feministic stance. So we're looking at the representation of Sita in the Adiya Ramayana here, and uh, because it is mostly about her that they sing. So she's presented as someone who's perfectly capable of making and exerting her own choice as first she falls in love with Ravana and then ask, uh, asked him for a vow that he shall not touch her body for 12 years. And to this Ravana does agree. So here you see that there's a, uh, the men and the women in the Adiya Ramayana are presented as equal partakers of life. If anything, the women are almost given godlike statuses and their greatness is recognized by the men around them. Later, after she marries Ram, she encounters several disagreements with him, and uh, she longs for the company of maids and companions. So in our reading of the Sanskritized Ramayana, we find that Sita is a very mute or lonely character. However, in the Adiya Ramayana, this loneliness is given an expression in the form of uh, neglect and lack of interest in her household duties. Such a subversive representation not only challenges the derogatory stereotype associated with women's role and responsibility, but also highlights and gives emphasis on the mental state of a woman in an unhappy marriage. So her retaliation makes the flaws in her husband more prominent and makes space to explore the shortcomings of a man who is considered to be ideal. Uh, there is another instance in the tale when Hanuman is threatened by the strength of a female boar, and he feels so enraged that he decided to pull down a hill. Sita then requests Hanuman not to do so and she blesses him. Now this hints at how women in the Adiya society often carry the burden of providing for their families and maintaining the sustenance of their natural resources. If looked at from an eco-feminist perspective, the patriarchal notion of masculinity that Hanuman held had the power to produce rage that could have exploited and led to the degradation of these resources. So the intimate relationship that tribal Sita shares with nature allows her to be most sensitive towards it. Another instance is mentioned when Rama and Lakshmana are tied to a tree and interrogated by tribal leaders for abandoning Sita. So here the close-knit tribal community acts as a counselor for the couple and they're already uh, also ready to punish and question the husband so as to give justice to the wife. Now, I've incorporated creation myths in my exploration because they have an overall effect on various streams of thoughts. More often than not, your humans derive their identity and orientation in the world from these creation myths. And this is reflected in the Adiya creation myths where both Sita, where both Shiva and Parvati are carefully making human figures out of clay. And the tribal creation myths therefore see a very united participation of the male and the female and incorporate uh, natural elements in them. Carl Jung, who is uh, uh, who's in, in his work called The Archetypes and the Collective Unconscious, he states that the archetypes portrayed in art, literature, and mythology are a reflection of the collective psyche of a community. So the tales express the unconscious element of a person's psyche. These creation myths, therefore, have set the foundations regarding gender roles and attitudes in the minds of the people of these tribes. So the scope of my paper is that I noticed that despite the Hindu tribal myths being so women-centric, the tribes by nature are considered to be very patriarchal. It is only reasonable to assume that uh, the alterations that one witnesses in the practice is not inherent, but is rather inculcated because of the interactions with non-tribal communities. And an alternate research can therefore be conducted to explore uh, the kind of influence that non-tribal communities have over tribal politics, uh, their culture, their worldview, and also their women. 
One can also analyze the relationship that tribal women share with nature through a very eco-feminist perspective. So to conclude, tribal Hindu mythologies do defy gender roles and responsibilities that are assigned to them by the society. And they make space for women to feel liberated or have a voice of their own and express themselves in ways that challenge patriarchal hegemony of the society. So the women in tribal mythology are, are truly an inspiration to uh, the tribal women today. And learning about empowered, fierce women in a matriarchal system can encourage these women to ex accept the fact that they too can become what their female ancestors were. And so I personally believe that an inventory of one's own past has the power to help the tribal work women perceive themselves as strong individuals. Thank you. Thank you, Jisha. Uh, uh, thanks, Jisha. Both of you actually uh, ended right on time. And I, I would just like to say that this was a really fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, I learned a lot from it. Uh, and especially because it flies in the face of the traditional narrative. Uh, and I, I really like that. Uh, which is very so it's very political in that way it um, shows not just the strength of women or tribal women but it shows that you know uh, the uh, approach of a word that's become a bit uh, disliked in today's politics liberalism not conservatism not anchored in conservatism because the ram and sita and these figures as known in the rest of the country through the mythologies of the North, especially not in the South, uh, <clears throat> are defined by conservatism and goodness and uh, good behavior, upright, uprightness and all that, all the, the many chances. So thank you for that. And uh, please send me how I can read the, uh, uh, the uh, Adiya um, Ramayana. Uh, so that uh, you know, I understand better uh, what is being said. Now, over to you. Uh, yeah, sir, we don't uh, have any uh, questions uh, yet for the two presenters. Any yeah, questions? But would they, uh, uh, if they don't, if you don't have any questions, can can I uh, can I pose uh, Please, a question sir. or two? Please, sir. Uh, the first is to, of course. Uh, uh, to Priyanka Desai, who uh, was looking at the lives of Kumbis and Goa through Konkani cinema, but he focused only on one film, right? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, I focused aren't on there two any other. Uh, and two uh, listen, listen, listen to my question. Were there, are there any other Konkani films or any other films? Uh, depicting the lives of uh, the Kunbis in some form or shape? Uh, yes, there is another one uh, which is uh, titled as Jesu. Uh, it's also in regional language, but it also depicts a lot of. There are no regional languages, they're only state languages. State language. Yeah. So what's it in Konkani? Yeah, it's in Konkani. But your recommendations were uh, were uh, were general to about the the tribe. You didn't say anything about the cinema because you're looking exploring the lives of them through cinema. So why didn't you why didn't you talk about the cinema part of it rather than they should get drinking water and uh, better uh, you know better uh, housing and stuff like that and access to health that that is true for everybody so why didn't you explore the paradigm of cinema because you're looking at it through cinema i didn't understand that uh while writing my paper sir i highlighted the parts wherein he uh, the director has focused on scenes uh, wherein he's highlighting uh, a particular area to show the darkness and all. But while covering this presentation, I thought of presenting only the theme which he's trying to convey through the film. 
So how does the film end? Ah, uh, the film ends uh, with the actually they have a bridge in between. When they say, they say uh, in the film it is depicted that these tribes live on the other side of the bridge, and the other side of the bridge is a uh, a hilly stage, hilly area where the tribe reside. So because of uh, some conflict between the tribes and the urban settlers the tribes decide to cut the bridge in between so that they they want to detach themselves totally from the urban settlers because the urban settlers are trying to put them down they are trying to subjugate them okay it sounds like an interesting film but when, when was it made then i'll come to jisha 2009 and it Sorry? has uh, 2009 okay All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Thanks for sending the link, Jisha. I'll, I'll open it and look at it. But uh, I had a question. Uh, is there in your study have we sought to make any comparative? Uh, have we looked, tried to compare at any point in the study, in your research, uh, the narratives? The con- in a way, it's a conflicting narrative. it's not just a challenging narrative it's a conflicting narrative with the narrative of the north of how uh, traditional you know how uh, in hindu mythology frankly uh, ram and sita and uh, lakshmana are portrayed as this god divine figures who can do no wrong all they do i mean he abandons his wife uh, and he uh, says that uh, uh, he uh, what, what does it do he also um uh takes a, another position as oh, oh in the, when he, he returns he uh, puts her through the agni pariksha so uh, you know that she has to prove her her uh, virtue uh, in so many ways so can you can you talk a little bit about that uh i i just try to rephrase that question just just to understand whether this is the question or not uh were you asking me if i uh, made a comparison between how uh, these tales these tribal tales are seen in the north and in the south was that the question well between the it's not just the south you're talking about the bhils the bhils are all over correct. they're not correct, just correct. in one part of uh, india they're not in Uh, just in Madhya Pradesh, you see them every in most parts. The, the Gonds and the Bhils are the biggest tribes of of of, of South Asia. Yes, sir. Yeah. Unfortunately, this has been one of the limitations of my study in the sense that uh, it was extremely difficult to find. english translations of these tales and uh, even the even the link to the book that i've sent in here has uh, the ramayanas of the entire there are various tribes in in vayanad actually and adya is just one amongst the many and uh, all of all of them have different versions of these tales and it was extremely hard to find like an english translation of the same similar with the case of the bill uh, um, mahabharata as well uh, bhagwandas patel wrote in uh, bengali and there is a hindi translation as well but because i'm not very fluent with the language i had to resort to a english translation and the english the problems with the english translations is that they only uh, uh, give you one particular narrative that they want to show in so they don't encompass every uh, tales in the story so for example the the part that we just mentioned about uh, uh, sita uh having to go through the agni pariksha or uh, be it uh, ram abandoning her and things those those parts haven't been mentioned extensively in these particular tales they only wanted to show how uh the the the, the, the traditions and the way of the world view of these tribes have been different uh which is the popular tales or popular narratives and things so i haven't come across any of uh, uh the section where they discuss these particular aspects so we can't hear you oh sorry uh, yeah this is a problem in zoom or video conference in you out of courtesy you switch your mic off anyway i was saying that thank you for that uh, jisha and i will look forward to reading this book 
and I hope your your work goes very well and it uh, you know it educates a lot of people. Uh, okay. Thank uh, you so much. Thanks a lot. Over to you. Yeah. So, sir, we go to the uh, third paper. Uh, this is by Aisha Femin, and she's from Jawaharlal Nehru University. Her paper is The Politics of Tribal Representation in Malayalam Films, a Post-Colonial Analysis. Over to you, Aisha. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and before I begin, I extend my apology for not keeping my camera on because I have a very serious network issue here. I don't know when I'll, I'll be disconnected. So I'm so sorry. I hope that will be fine. Uh, I'm Aisha Femin, and I'm currently pursuing my master's. I'm presenting on the topic, uh, the politics of tribal representation in Malayalam films, uh, attempting a post-colonial analysis. Uh, beginning with the historical studies of Kerala caste and uh, Kerala's caste and class segregation are still prevalent because the basic institutions of such segregation have not been removed but rather manifested to modern institutions and films and visual representation are, are one such institution. Uh, the colonial structure in the visual media, which sidelines particular sections of society, like tribals, is invisible to normalize at times. And instead, the construction of the colonial structure itself is unrecognizable because of the normalized passive acceptance of the structurality of the structure. In order to trace the politics of tribal representation, I've selected two films. Uh, one is Eobinda Pustaka, which was released in uh, 2014. And... Um, Another one is Unda, which is uh, which was released in 2020. Uh, so, Eobinda Bustagam is a movie which is set in the pre-independence era of Munnar, Western Ghats, and which is an area of tea plantation travels, uh, majorly the Mudavins and Pulaya, etc. So, the movie portrays the life of tribals, uh, not under the British colonials, but under the colonial power structure within independent India. The movie shows how Eob and his sons treat the tribals. They're given mere lands for housing and settlements, smaller areas for cultivation with stringent uh, rent laws. And the movie portrays how Eob's sons use their land to hold power upon the tribal population by mistreating men, raping women, making children work in hazardous conditions. The terror of colonialism was created to take away the lands, and even biopolitical power is also used. When the epidemic, which is known as Vasudi's death, measures are taken by the landlords, that is the Eub and his sons, to regulate the disease. However, the regulating measures were structured against a particular session of society, the tribals. The movie shows the character Chembin, whose house was burned along with his family members because they were suspected of being caught by the pandemic. Eob and Sons used the biopolitical power to erase the tribals from their population. And since, since it was in the name of disease, justification was given and resistance was cut off. Uh, through its careful construction of continuity of colonial power, even after independence, the movie redefines certain resistance from the colonized. The colonized, all the tribals here, have a voice, and the character champion represents the voice of the other. The tribal community forms resistance once colonialism starts intervening even in the simplest level of existence. Just their single voice of dissent, one act of resistance itself, scares the entire power structure. Uh, to Edward say, more than a military political discourse, colonialism was marked by an epistemology, where the pagan East becomes the other of Christian Europe. Hence, Orientalism is a form of epistemological imperialism uh, based on Foucault's theories of power and epistemology. Says, Said argues that the representation of the Eastern system of knowledge, ethnography, archaeology, literature, etc., were indispensable for constructing a superior Europe. It follows that this strategy of constructing the Orient as the binary opposite to the Occident, Europe is what East is not, civilized, developed, and Christian. It's essential for sanctifying the civilizing mission of colonialism. Uh, the next movie I've chosen was Unda, which was released in 2019. The movie actually resonates the colonialism in contemporary times. Though evolutions have happened to several systems, the structurality of colonialism remains the same. The movie portrays a team of freshly trained policemen from Kerala who reaches a Maoist-prone area for election duty. The movie creates a frightening atmosphere about the area, which is a tribal populated area. And the violence stereotypically is associated with the tribal population. And the film's first half supports the colonial imagination of tribals as violent, extremist, and uncivilized. 
and the movie slowly unfolds the reality of colonialism in the imaginary construction of what the tribal population is among the police officers and the police officers colonial Im- imagination is legitimized only because they represent the state and hence the colonial ideology that the state imagination is always the legitimate imagination the movie takes a different turn only when the police officers realize they do not have bullets in the gun for counter attacks and the bullets here represent the power of state or rather violence of the state without which the very existence of governmental power seems to be impossible throughout the film we see the fear in the police force just because they do not have bullets with them and the prototypical symbols of violence from the time of british colonialism has remained the same so the film takes a post colonial turn from the enrochment of fear and the absence of bullet which is a symbol of power the film reimagines the colonial imagination through a post colonial lens the film addresses how the tribals are colonized the only tribal voice in the film kunal chand says how the entire tribal community is denied basic rights like water food shelter education and he says how they constantly haunted by different political groups as well as the state he also adds that whoever questioned the sovereign power of government is punished and the punishment includes forceful disappearance or forceful detention kunal chand himself is in search of his son who he thought thought was kept in detention and the movie in the final part re- uh, reveals his son's death in a fake encounter while the newspapers tag him as a maoist kunal chand's son was attested only because he raised his voice against the state policies so this proves how the state punishes the voice of dissent and how the repression and suppression of the state are justified because of the colonially imposed idea that the ones who do not follow the state must be full of violence the orientalized here becomes the tribals who are rather denied or who did not choose modernity the movie also portrays the issue of government system how the government conducts election which is the fundamental fabric of any democracy and the movie shows how the government records do not even have the actual records of tribal population and this shows how the system are institutionalized only for a particular section of society and the absence of recognition as a as a nation citizen positions the individual in a state of uncertainty where all their possessions and survival can be taken away and the one who takes away won't be answerable to any institution so when one side of the movie portrays a denied accessibility of tribals the other side of the movie represents the attempt of them strongly demanding their rights kunal chand at the end of the movie says how he plans to go to the police office in search of his son the story also represents the character of biju kumar who works as a police constable and belongs to a tribal caste the character himself re- reiterates his claim he describes how he believed that education could be his savior from all the troubles but several characters makes jokes about him based on his caste and identity and he describes how this funny acts for passers by are the never ending discrimination he has to face and we do finally decides to leave his job because he finds the mental torturing based on his identity as something which can never be fought back with any factors like education or a decent job so the continuum of discrimination towards the tribals is highlighted These incidents cannot be can also be read through the lens of Homi Ke Baba who describes how colonized people resisted the empire Baba sees mimicry as a conflict resulting in in colonial ambivalence when the colonial discourse encourages the colonized subject to mimic the colonizer by adopting the colonizer's cultural habits assumptions institutions values the result is a crack in the colonial psyche since the mimicry becomes a mockery there emerges an uncertainty in the former's control of the latter's behavior so bijus attempt to come out of the other the rest of his colleagues laughing and mocking at him kishan singh sons arrest for his voice of dissent can all be read from this point of view even the most Sorry to disturb aisha you need to uh, conclude in the next 2 minutes yes sir i'm just concluding so even the most slavish attempts of the colonial subject to imitate his master result in an advent threat to the colonial order concluding my presentation representation is a significant element of identity when art forms itself is from the perspective of the pol- political ideology of the creator who mostly belongs to the known other section of the society the voice of the other never resonates in such art forms and this absence of voice paves the way for other rising leading to selective forgetfulness so the idea of orientalizing the tribals is in- inexcusable in layers of narration where the powerful imagines the tribals according to their imagination by establishing their perceptions as authenticated and the concepts of development civilization and peace were used as a means to means of conquest and imagination the movies and the structurality of the layers of narration ensure the undestroyed colonial structure 
in the contemporary era. And decolonization does not imply a situation where a nation and its people and the so-called culture go thoroughly back to the period before colonialism. And such a meaning would become largely unacceptable. So it refers to the twin phases of the colonial project, the formal dismantling of colonial political administrative machinery and the emergence of late capitalist economies. So it covers all the cultures affected by the imperial process from the moment of colonization to the present day. And Homi K. Baba notes ambivalence is an un unwelcome aspect of the colonial discourse for the colonizer as mimicry causes a split in the colonizer's ego. So this ego works against the tribal population as in the movies. This ego takes away the land and modes of survival of the tribal population in the name of development. And any voice for the rights and against the sovereign power will only lead to the prototypical representation of tribals as violent. So this ego does not give tribal population any rights and attempts to erase them from legal and uh, cultural institutions. So a rejoining of the boundaries is possible through the term hybridity, as Nankomi Kebaba says, which stresses the independence and the mutual construction of the subjectivities of the colonizer and the colonized. So the borders that are conventionally assumed to exist between the colonizer and colonized self and the other are refigured to show a no man's land, an in-between space that simultaneously divides and connects two areas. So I, I conclude by saying that the intermingling of cultures and contesting the idea of cultural purity in the theory of hybridity is necessary. Only such an attempt can decode the process of worlding as said by Spivak. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you, Aisha. Um, you spoke very fast, so uh, you know, I think you are very conscious of the time and Ankana has appointed himself as my timekeeper, so I don't have to cut anybody off. Um, but, and I'm just, uh, I'm fascinated by the fact that at least two of our presenters today have chosen to look at uh, films as a form of uh, uh, understanding uh, a very complex uh, issue or uh, set of issues. I don't have a, a comment on this, but we'll wait for the second paper. Uh, sure. Which is by Vasundara Gautam, is it? Yes, Vasundara Gautam. Okay. Uh, she's a PhD scholar, scholar from Jamia Millia Islamia. Her paper is Identity, Misrepresentation and Conflict Through the Lenses of an Adivasi Woman Poet. Oh, good. Somebody from Jamia, my old uh, hangout place. Thank you. Sir, I'm also Please from Jamia. You didn't recognize me. How can I recognize you if, if you wrap yourself up in all these, you know, I'm used to seeing people in more informal attire and not, I'm used to seeing them face to face, not to, not in yeah. strange things called Zoom and Google Hangout. Anyway, uh, wasn't there <coughs> all yours? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Ankan. Uh, the pres uh, the uh, title of my presentation is Identity, Misrepresentation and Conflict Through the Lenses of an Adivasi Woman Poet. For this particular paper, I have picked up uh, Nirmala Putul. She is a Santhali woman writer. Um, um, till now, she has uh, published more than three to four uh, poetry collections. And uh, the major point that I'm trying to make in this particular paper is that there are uh, there are a number of um, debates about Adivasi identity to uh, clean water to many other things that Adivasi is are actually demanding. But uh, from uh, from an Adivasi woman uh, from an Adivasi woman's perspective, she uh, for her even the Adivasi themselves the uh, males are also uh, people who are creating more problems uh, in, in her life. So uh, I start my paper now. Uh, Nirmala Putul is a renowned Santhali uh, women writer and poet who has given voice to many Adivasi concerns in her poetry, especially the women's questions in, uh, in which it is often conveniently ignored by the Adivasi male writers. So uh, writers like Devnathan and Virginia Skhaka, they describe, describe two kinds of social exclusion of the Adivasis. Uh, they are, one is exclusion from the excess uh, to, uh, to or a denial of rights to uh, various services such as health, education, housing, water, with sanitation, also being more recently included as an essential service. And the other for, form of exclusion is deprivation of right 
to express one's view of representation and voice. Uh, it is the pain of these exclusions that find expression in Nirmala Putu's poetry, particularly from the stand standpoint of an Adivasi woman whose marginalization becomes manifold. So I'm reading a, a section of a poem. Um, it's in Hindi. I'm, I'm reading the translation of it. Dark as their skin, but like their glossy teeth, they are radiant and calm within, sticking red and yellow leaves in their hair bun. When they dance in a group, Spring comes untimely, calling at the best of drums. Who has introduced them like this with such big lies? He must be one among us, a well-off person, one who wraps the truth in gauze, an unabashed mercenary. He must be a traitor of words, perhaps a poet, one with crippled senses. Uh, so the poet critically engages with the bird's eye view, uh, which constructs a picturesque outlook of the Adivasi society. Although the description present uh, presents a very idealistic and dreamy portrayal of Adivasi girl, the poem here is a satirical take on existing misconceptions regarding Adivasi women in the mainstream society. It also challenges the authority and authenticity of such poets. This poem raises three very pertinent questions. First, who are Adivasi women? Uh, secondly, why such uh, depictions are popular among the dhikus uh, or the non-Adivasis? Dhiku is the word that Santhali is used for non-Adivasis. And lastly, who are responsible for such misrepresentation? All these questions are interconnected as the image of Adivasi women is majorly based on the misrepresentation in popular imagination ingrained in the scriptures and mythological texts popular among non-Adivasis. Taking cue from such depictions, Nirmala Putul looks into the larger question of Adivasi women identity, their misrepresentation and their alienation within their own society. Many writers uh, about Adivasis, um, uh, many writers about Adivasis, uh, about Adivasis by non-Adivasi writers have failed uh, to present a faithful picture of Adivasis. So, um, so novels such as The Strange Case of Billy Viswas presents a very idyllic view of uh, a universe where people uh, uh, you know, um, just run away to. So such representations are there where you know they uh, take it as a safe haven. I'm actually skipping this particular part of my paper. And then you can actually also look at many of the mainstream Bollywood movies, starting from uh, the movie Shalimar, uh, where in it's in 1978, there are many, um, you know, song sequences um, uh, of Hum Bevafa Hargizna Thay or O Babul Pyare, which is another movie movie called Johnny uh, Mira Nam. It's in 1970s, where there are many uh, uh, too uh, recent as 2016, which is Naksha, where Adivasis are presented as people who wrap around um, colorful beads around them or leaves around them and paint themselves all colorful and, and you know, such depictions are presented. Um, it is in the backdrop of such numerous instances of mis misrepresentation in the popular culture that the representation of Adivasis in Nirmala Putul's poetry attempt to deconstruct such existing stereotypes. The other poem that uh, I'm dealing with is Adivasi Ladkiyon Ke Baare Mein and Adivasi uh, Women. Adivasi Ladkiyon Ke Baare Mein, Adivasi Striyan or Bahamuni. Again, um, all the three poems, they talk about how women are misrepresented or, um, you know, in the, in, in the, poetry or writings of Adivasis or non-Adivasis, both. The, uh, now moving to the sex, uh, second section of my paper. Uh, uh, again, it talks about the actual, uh, the actual, um, uh, the reality of the Adivasi society. So this is one poem called the Two Churka Surin. Uh, how opportunist is he, the head of the community who only for a bottle of liquor trades the whole village and they take away your girls like a stack of wood by overloading um, in their vehicles, they were your girls. So this is a poem about, you know, how Adivasi women uh, forcefully were sold off to different communities. Um, and it's a comment on prostitution, to forceful marriages. Uh, again, uh, the people who are involved in uh, such practices are 
uh, not the outsiders, but many of the insiders uh, or, or, uh, within the community. And uh, these people, so it also highlights the problem of alcoholism in uh, Adivasi society. Uh, again, uh, the roots of which goes back to the colonial period, where uh, initially when uh, they used to drink mohua and other uh, beverages, um, the British government put a ban to it, and uh, they were only sold the liquor from the shops. And it uh, the the then the indebtedness and other problems became rampant in Adivasi society. So in after 1947, uh, after independence, basically there have been many struggles in which you know Adivasi. Adivasi women were struggling against the smaller, smaller problems like alcoholism and, you know, wife beating to domestic violence to whatnot. So the second part of the paper actually deals with this. It also, uh, there is another poem that I, uh, I'll just read um, the uh, the part of the poem uh, to you. It is from Kuch Mat Kaho Sajuni Kisku. Uh, it is uh, about the marital rape. Uh, and, uh, and and the problem uh, within the family. So uh, to protect uh, the honor, this is the poem, to protect honor of their own community, they tied you like a bull with the cart. Those merciless people tied you and forced you to eat food fodder. So again, uh, this whole poem is about that. Uh, so uh, uh, Santhal women are not supposed to touch the uh, the uh, equipments that are used in the fields. So in case they do, then they are uh, punished and they're punished severely. So um, so they are not this. They were like tied to the bull, uh, tied to the cart like a bull. They were forced to eat fodder or they were raped. Or, or many other things. So she talks about these actual problems that happen in the uh, tribal society. I just quickly move on to the last part of my paper. I hope I have two minutes. Um, yeah, just so the, two minutes. Yeah, great. Uh, in two minutes, I'll wrap up my paper. So in the in the first two sections of my paper, I have dealt with the portrayal of Adivasi women as shown from the perspective of the other, which includes both Adivasi and non-Adivasi. The third section deals with the feeling of homelessness within the home, the feeling of emptiness and alienation in a woman, even after an entire life of selfless service to her parents, husband, and children. So this is the poem, uh, Kya Tum Jante Ho. So uh, this is, uh, again, I'll read a section, a part of it. Do you know the tale of women's relationship? Can you tell a woman? Look from a woman's perspective, definition of womanhood. If not, then what do you know apart from her role in the kitchen and bedroom about a woman? So this is uh, one part. And the other is uh, from uh, another poem, which is called Apne Ghar Ki Talash Me. Uh, inside me, the hole in me, um, I, I am scattered all over the place, but this house is not mine. So she is basically talking about the loneliness and the emptiness uh that uh, you know she faces within her own community because she cannot relate to her own people on many levels so she kind of underlines that so um yeah, so this paper looks into three levels of alienation and challenges faced by Adivasi women from outside world, their community, and their own homes. Through a study of select poem, it is shown that Nirmala Putul's poem gave voice to the unaddressed issues related to Adivasi women, their personal space and identity. Furthermore, she not only raises her voice against the exploitation by the outsider, but also the insider, a conflict that is generally not represented by a lot of Adivasi male writers. Beyond the discernible feminist voices in her poem, Nirmala Putul's poem can also be seen as re realistic social commentary on the Adivasi community as a whole. More importantly, an objective representation of Adivasi reality. Thank you so much. I hope I finished on time. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, that was really very uh, interesting and very very useful to to hear um, looking at poetry to uh, do a deep dive into these issues um, we have time for questions now right yeah so anoop has raised a hand 
Andung, do you want to question? Do you have a question? Andung. It says he is presenting. What is he presenting? Maybe by mistake. I don't know. Anup, do you want to ask a question? I don't think he has a question. If he doesn't have a question, could you, you Anup, can I request you to stop the presentation? If you want to ask a question, please ask the question. I think he stopped presenting now. I don't think so. There's a question. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Nothing. Are, the come on. Board. Come on. There are about 60. The, Anup has raised his hand. So I presume okay. he has a question. So could you un unmute yourself and speak? You have to unmute yourself. Otherwise, I'll go to the next person. Okay, I presume you're not interested in asking a question. Um, anybody else? There are approximately, how many people are there? 63 or 53? Yeah. 63. I'm sure out of the 63... Sanjukta oh, Naskar has a question. Yes, yeah, Sanjukta, please come in. Hello, hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you, all the presenters. I have a question for Vasundhara. Uh, you mentioned, uh, it was very interesting, your paper, and thank you for enlightening me. Uh, so you mentioned the fact that there is actually, um, you know, even within the society, I mean, the tribal society that we kind of has been engaging in for the past uh, more than 24 hours. Uh, and you mentioned that there is a problem within the society in terms of the fact that women are exploited within the society. So all these while we've been having a very uh, kind of... Uh, we have an image of an external uh, agency which is imposing itself upon uh, the tribal society. For example, there's the government, you had the colonial uh, uh, you know, rulers. Uh, but now you talk about a society which is, I guess, more real for us, that there is a lot of exploitation even within. Uh, I just wanted to know if, uh, you know, is this something which has uh, emerged post-independence uh, or have you realized it at a time when probably there is more exposure to the outside world? I mean, how do you read the situation? Okay, uh, so uh, see, uh, if you, uh, for example, if you, even if you, let's say, read Things Fall Apart, which is a very popular novel, you will see that, you know, there are problems within the society. But when they stand against somebody, they stand as a whole. But that doesn't mean that there are no problems within the society. So there are ma many people, like starting from, um, I don't know, uh, one, it is, uh, it was, prob uh, so, so there are no documented proof that it was there before uh, the, the, you know, in the pre-independence era. So mostly the literature that I have is post um, 1980s and, um, so one is that. So I am not very sure whether it was there before or not. But many of the problems are uh, rooted in many of the laws that were made by the Britishers. So be it the Forest Act, or be it, be it the Land Act, or uh, many others, like you know the registration of when the registration of the land started. So many matriarchal societies they converted to patriarchal one because they started registering in the name of the men. So when men started registering, so women were isolated automatically. So there were many problems that are rooted back, but literature as such is not available. Uh, so I am not very sure whether I have answered your question or not. Maybe, uh, Asundara, I could just, if with the permission of the chair, if I could just add one more line to... Yes. Yes. May I, Ankun, sir? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so I was just thinking that, you know, since you did mention the colonial administrators and there was a huge body of documentation that is available. Uh, I think you're under the misapprehension that Ankan is the chair. He's not. I'm so sorry because he's the one. No, 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 not at all, sir. So actually, yeah, so if you can address a question to me, yes, so you can. Yes, sir. Make it, make I, it, I, don't, sir, don't, make, don't make the, your question a statement, you know. There is limited time, so make it one. If it's one okay. sentence, then make it one sentence. 
Okay, okay, sir. I, I can get in touch with Vasundara. Thank you. Thank you for your time. The uh, one thing that uh, intrigues me about many of these presentations is uh, because I do a lot of it in my own uh, writing and I see other people also do it, is the question of uh, comparative studies. Whether you, because that enriches a lot of the work that one does sharp focus on. So have you looked at Mahashwata, Mahashwata Devi? Because she, uh, above anybody else, ab apart from Ganesh Devi, you know, and his great uh, linguistic survey of India. And, so, sir, uh, I have looked at Mahashweta Devi's work. I have looked at Ganesh Devi's work. Subhranshu Chaudhary is working in this area. Uh, Ramnika Gupta is working. She passed away very recently. She has also worked in this, this area and collected. But many Adivasi writers, they reject their writing by saying that they are outsiders and they present a different view. So, they are not presenting uh, our reality. So many of them are so, so very similar to the Dalit question, where many Dalit writers say that, you know, since they are outsider, they don't experience our reality. I have looked at these writings, and I really find them very intriguing. Um, so yes. Well, it's also good to look at other writing emerging from other literature. We're going to have Grace, who's going to talk about proverbs and so on in a few minutes. And I've heard her before, and it's very good. but. You know, there is a lot of writing, uh, both nonfiction as well as fiction, uh, poetry and ballads, uh, music, films coming out of especially the Northeast, because I know that very area reasonably well. And uh, even the fiction is based on deep realities. The poetry is like an anguished cry from the heart. You know, some poetry has just emerged, as Grace would know, from the recent killings of these uh, very uh, unfortunate, innocent uh, coal miners in Nagaland. Uh, and uh, I think uh, so you should, you might consider, and it's not my job to tell you what you should do or shouldn't do, you might consider also looking at uh, other tribal voices, you know, from the region of that we call the Northeast. I think that might be useful for you to look at, because those are as authentic as you can get. And unlike the Adivasis, I, I've been at conferences, academic conferences with the Adivasis and uh, 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 other groups. I, I take great offense to being called tribals, but the Northeastern groups had no problem at all. So it's, it's rather interesting how this plays out. OK, I'll stop here. And thank you both thank for you. your presentation, you. Aisha and uh, Vasundara and Ankan. So our next uh, speaker is Siam or uh, Grace Hangzhou. She is an associate professor, Department of English, Shivaji College. Her paper is called "Locating the Feminine in Paite Pangnok." Mm -hmm. I'm sorry if I mispronounced. That's perfectly fine, uh, Anka, and I am used to this <laughs> pronunciation issues. So, uh, if the chair permits, I will start. And I will uh, try to compress it within uh, the eight to ten minutes that I have. So uh, the reason why I wrote this paper was uh, first to, you know, uh, demystify this aura that is that has been um, created around the idea of uh, northeastern tribes, especially the tribe that I come from, the Paite tribe, which is from Manipur. Uh, we we inhabit the Churachanpur district of Manipur and parts of Champai district of Mizoram. So the idea that is there is that you know women are very progressive. The society is very the society is matriarchal, which it is not. Uh, so the reason why I chose this topic was to look at you know uh, proverbs, you know daily utterances, and to see you know how how much what is the reality. And how much of it has been, you know, carried from antiquity uh, to the present day? Okay, so I will just start reading my paper. So it is, uh, it is an uncontested fact that all written literature has an oral genesis, and therefore a study of any community is inconceivable without an examination of its traditional narratives. 
An important, though often disregarded, genre of folk literature are proverbs, which have been cursorily, uh, cursorily considered as being far too simple in its structure and content to be accorded any significance. However, paramology has assigned a far more critical and fundamental role to proverbs in reconstructing the history of a community. In the nature of the proverb, Bartlett J. R. Whiting attributes a proverb's intrinsic function to espouse a, quote, a fundamental truth, that is, a truism, quote, closed, as a result of its origins from within the community. These sayings are often in a, quote again, homely language and maybe with alliteration and rhyme, having at times both a literal and figurative meaning. It is in this context that Paite Paunak, that is Proverbs, Paite Proverbs, will be studied in this paper. While there abound several proverbs in the Paite language, this paper will emphasize on the women-centric sayings in the traditional oral narratives. Now, oral texts such as Proverbs are linguistic determinants of social roles and the social spaces within which these verbal utterances are made and are therefore also the product of societal relationships. The traditional understanding of biological differences that has given men systemic control over women through the patriarchal constitution of social cultural practices therefore also extends to its language. Uh, Kwesi Yanka in Proverbs, the Aesthetics of Traditional Communication delineates how proverbs are not just mere utterances, but an embodiment of, quote, a people's cultural aesthetic, quote, closed, and are rhetorical devices to validate pre-established and uncontested social cultural norms. Usually the speaker is someone who's older or who holds a higher social status and the context of the usage has been either to guide or admonish the listeners. The thematic orientation of Paite Paunak, which draws upon motives from nature, the domestic space and gendered mannerisms reveal the dichotomy that pits a woman against a man and simultaneously against another woman too. Much of the women-centric Paite Paunak revolve around marriage and the household. Customer, uh, customary practices uh, ensure that women remain tied to these two social institutions. Marriage provides her material requirements and social security. Um, uh, Sylvia Walby notes that, quote unquote, marriage and home homemaking is only all right for women because the alternatives are worse. The household, to, be it her paternal or marital one, becomes the site of oppression and control. To contextualize this observation to the early Paite experience, it can be stated that there are no alternatives. A Paite woman's role was circumscribed within domesticity and marriage, so much so it was a common practice to encourage older unmarried women to at least have an illegitimate child who would take care of her in her old age. The disdain reserved for unmarried older women, however, did not extend to men. On the contrary, men have been spared the ignominy of remaining unmarried till late in life as their contribution has always been measured in tangible activities such as hunting, agriculture and physical labor. The proverb, Boang Upa in Lopa No No Do, meaning an aged cow prefers tender grass, indicates a common practice in which older men often married much younger girls. Clearly, despite his age, an older man did not face any difficulties in securing a bride for himself. This proverb is also, is also often used to deride aged widowers who more often than not look, uh, took younger women as their new brides. Numei khat le sing khat, meaning a woman and a log weigh the same, is another paunak which equates the value of a woman to that of a log, which is easily carried by a man on his shoulders. Both are available in plenty and do not require much effort to be carried around. This also implies that a man enjoyed the freedom and the luxury of being able to choose any woman and also disturbingly could also replace them as, a as their substitute could be easily arranged. Thus the need for a man to ensure, sorry, thus the need for a woman to ensure her personal, material and social security begins very early on. And now I'll come to the point where it says, so uh, it was customary for boys, young boys to court uh, young girls in the evenings. So after their agricultural work, they would go to their uh, to the to the girls' house in hordes, uh, and set within this cultural practice the proverb "Nume tam na in wal hol, pasal tam na in bo pangkwal," implying a house with many daughters attracts company, while the granary widens in the house of sons. Makes a gendered economic observation on this practice of courtship. Each visit was a test of the hospitality of the young woman. The generosity was unavoidable, was an unavoidable financial burden on the girl's family as their daughter's fame and popularity were measured by the number of courtiers that visited their house. 
in a family with many girls, the burden was even greater. But the good reputation that the daughters earned proved invaluable when it resulted in many eligible bachelors wooing them. Another gender economic proverb is Nungak Melho Ilesial Talian. A beautiful maiden is worth a healthy mithun. It quantifies the value of a woman in terms of a mithun, which is a you know a, a local variety of uh, buffalo uh, that commanded the highest value of exchange in the barter system. So both the sayings reveal the contradictions encountered in allocating a capitalized significance to women. The value of a woman is also enumerated in terms of her conduct. The following expressions reinforce the representation of women as being loudmouthed and incapable of logical reasoning among many of her numerous shortcomings, which diminishes her worth. Numei Paule Ak Piquan, a woman's words are like the clucking of a hen. It is the crowing of a rooster which signals a new day. The clucking of the hen has no importance. Hence, the opinion of a woman is not to be entertained while making crucial decisions. Likewise, Numei Thule Vok Kuang Dai Dai compares a woman's articulacy to the shallow, stinky feeding trough of pigs. So the, juxt the juxtaposition that is being made here is that the woman's uh, verbal assertions, you know, they are irrelevant and therefore there should not be any value accorded to it. A woman's voice therefore is extraneous and therefore it should not be taken seriously. However, there is no corresponding ridicule for a man and it is practically non-existence apart from one solitary saying which is pasal thulet tempong mol implying that the opinion of a foolish man is akin to a blunt machete. So even in the, you know, even even, even when they are criticizing the uh, the, the uh, shortcoming of a man, it is, it is still being done with the phallic imagery of a machete. Now, um, if you look at it further, uh, see, Paite proverbs are rarely sympathetic utterances. Rather, they are direct condemnations that warn other women. And the following examples will reveal this criticism that is directed at deviant women, especially daughter-in-laws, by, com by comparing them with filthy domestic analogies. So an evil woman finds humor in the curled feces of a hen is one such example. The defining characteristic of a good woman is the geniality that endears her to all. As opposed to this is the behavior of an evil woman who reserves her cordiality for strangers while she remains grim faced with her husband's family. More than her wickedness, it is a foolishness that is being stressed upon by commenting on the inferiority of what or whom she chooses to engage with. In this case, the curled excrement of a hen of a hen uh, censure and punishment yeah, are meted out include your paper in the next in the next yeah I, i'll wrap it up censure and punishment are meted out both to men and women and uh, you know uh, see for example i'll give you here numei gilo in singkwa bok twak pasal gilo in saliang pet a club for a wayward woman and a meat for an errant man so when a man committed a crime he was to make a penance by slaughtering an animal and offering to the uh, to the village chief and a piece of that animal was returned to him uh, you know as a mark of the village chief accepting his penance but for the woman the you know the, the woman received the battering of a woman of a wooden club for her misconduct and um, uh, to corroborate this aggression uh, is which means an evil woman is acquainted with a man's fist now uh, there are also precautionary proverbs which say so for example a pampered daughter will most likely an unwed mother be so the idea is control your daughters or else you will you know they will become uh, you will let more they will become debased they will end up becoming unwed mothers now uh, i'll just uh, wrap it up quickly here so a primary duty of the mother of the woman is to uh, be the caregiver and this is visualized in the proverb aisa api sik tai anozong sik tai meaning children follow the footsteps of the mother in which it uh, this proverb talks of the unique locomotory style of a crab you know which walks backward so the idea is that if the mother walks backward the children will also learn to walk like her so i'll just wrap up the pauna that have been elaborated upon denote the restrictive framework within which a woman remains controlled by men and social customs. The notions of virtue and morality were defined by men and these labels could have only been acquired by internalizing the stoicism and subordination which the demands of familial responsibilities made upon women. Adherence to these values were either coerced or passively inculcated. Conversely, the predominance of proverbs concerning the kitchen and domestic space can only attest to the conflict between the home and the world and the symmetry of the power according to men and women i will stop here i hope 
I, I hope you've been able to make sense of this rush job. Uh, this, this is what happens when you get the last slot. Um, but this is it. And this is actually part of a larger chapter that I'm writing for my PhD. And uh, this, uh, I have looked at about um, 300 proverbs, of which about 60 are uh, specific only to women. And uh, about of the 60, 20 are what you would call positive sayings. But even that is also to be taken with a pinch of salt. So, um, Professor Hazarika, if you have anything to say. No, I have just I'm one done. word, one yes, word. Sir. Wow. Yes, Sort of, no, I, that's, I pretty, that's, it, pretty, that's pretty mind blowing, you know. I mean, I uh, it is so sharp, and uh, you know, I mean, the sayings you've quoted, I'm not saying you're sharp, but I'm saying the <laughs> sayings you've quoted are so, um, you know, uh, I mean, c comparing, uh, uh, you know, basically stuff to chicken shit, so to give the expression is really Good experiment. Uh, Curly yeah, well, experiment of a hen. Yeah, well, whatever. It comes to the same thing. It's a four-letter word. Anyway. Uh, but uh, I think a lot of the things that you said were, were really quite uh, stark and, and uh, stark and striking. And I hope that you will, there's a book there, you know. You should really work on this. Your PhD you will publish at some point. But this is what you need to work on for a book. Your, yes. The publishers will run to you for this. And at some point, you want a connection to a publisher, I'll be very happy yes. to. Oh, thank you, you sir. Thank or you any, so any, much. any of the thank people so on much. this. I really enjoyed this, this session, by the way. I'm coming back into an academic session after a few weeks. So it's really been very, very enjoyable to listen to everybody. And um, yeah, who who is the last speaker? I don't have any questions, but I don't. Uh, I wonder if anybody has. Uh, no is questions. There one last speaker. Yes, one last paper we have. Uh, then then we can have the speakers uh, the questions after that. Thank, so you, Zoe, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. So next, and I must apologize to Sanjukta. I think I cut her off a bit abruptly. So uh, you know, I hope she doesn't mind. The last time. So. Yeah, please go ahead. Uncle. Uh, so la last speaker is Zoya Ribello. She is from the Department of English, Parvati Bai Chogule College of Arts and Science. Her paper is called Development or Destruction, a Tribal Perspective through Orijit Sen's graphic novel, The River of Stories. Over to you, Zoya. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Zoya Ribello. And uh, with the permission of the chair, I'm going to start presenting uh, my presentation now. Please let me know if you can see it. Is it visible to all of you? Yes. All right. Um, yeah, so my topic today is development of destruction, a tribal perspective through uh, Orijit Sen's graphic novel, The River of Stories. So the aim of my paper was to mainly understand and analyze these tribal perspectives of um, of the modern idea of urban development, as well as to delve into the, uh, the destructive consequences of this so-called modern development towards these indigenous communities. And this will be looked all while using the examples of Orijit Sen's graphic novel, The River of Stories. So um, who are the Adivasis? The, Adiva the, the term Adivasi is a Sanskrit word. When you translate it into English, roughly translates to the settlers from the very beginning. And as we know, uh, India has the largest indigenous population in the world. And the Adivasis comprise of 67.6 million of the country's population. And their presence has um, in India predates even that of the Aryans and the Dravidians. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you here. Haven't you, this is the fourth session, hasn't, uh, Ankan, please correct me if I'm wrong, but surely uh, you've already been through who the Adivasis are. And yeah, yeah I've, been, that. I've been since yesterday. Well, then, in that case, you can skip all this right, slide, I'll just skip, get, get, get to what you're presenting, because right. everything I'll, is known to people. I'll skip all of this then. Um, so, the um, okay, I'll start with the, the River of Stories. I'm just trying to save you time. That's yes, right. okay, I completely understand. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, so unfortunately, the Adivasis have um, been through a lot of hardships and faced these immense stereotypes, which cause them to be looked down upon, uh, being considered lesser humans. And in, in India's mission of this alleged modern development, it could result in the cultural extinction of the majority of these communities. So um, the book that I was focusing on for my paper was is um, Origin Sain's 1994 uh, graphic novel called The River of Stories, which traces the Narmata Bachao Mandolin, as well as a series of protests in the North early 90s. So I had the privilege of having uh, to talk to Origin Sain himself, where he spoke to me about his first-hand experiences during his time uh, in the protests, as well as his time spending with the people who live there. Uh, and he said that this um, book acts as this historical document that exposes the environmental, social, cultural, political concerns that surround this very crucial but very controversial time. Um, and because a lot of this, um, a lot of uh, he he uses two narratives to talk about uh, to express this these concerns. Where it's the first of a, a journalist, which you can kind of think uh, he projects himself through, because again, like I said these are his own experiences as well as he uh, exploring these ancient mythologies and legends of the indigenous community um he also uh, through the book he also talks about how uh, destruction is a byproduct of development that showcases how one community benefits over the downfall of the other so one of the major themes portrayed by sen is uh, that of social class and how this is kind of like the foundation of what kickstarts the idea of why uh, development is actually destruction for uh, these communities. Uh, there's no denying that there is this um, unsaid uh, division between the Adivasis and general public, aside from the fact that there's this very, uh, this physical distance where we don't really interact with them. And whenever we do, it's, it tends to be very unsavory. There's also this mental uh, distance between um, this modern uh, projection of us and this savage portrayal of, of them. So this creates this uh, uh, me metaphorical wall and divides them, alienating them, and then brands them as this other. And uh, this metal wall thickens because of these offensive stereotypes that is uh, pro perpetuated through mainstream media that um, calls them backward and savage. And this ostracizes them. And they face, the, they face uh, marginalization and exclusion in almost every sphere of life. Um, these hostile uh, narratives also take away from the credibility of their lives and what they're fighting for and their protests. And this results in broadening, uh, broadening that gap and even the causes unequal distribution of uh, resources. Uh, and uh, what, what's upsetting is that the government and the people behind the idea of development use this social class and this hierarchy, as well as these uh, stereotypes to justify the destruction of the lives of the Adivasi people, that they're just simply a byproduct of something that is they call a greater cause. So these are a, a few examples of um, in, in the uh, graphic novel itself, where you can uh, see instances where they are spoken down upon, where they are insulted because they are considered to be uneducated. Um, and so they are unintelligent because they are uneducated. Then uh, even um, he talks about uh, in this instance over here, in this uh, picture over here, you can see how uh, these are the displaced Adivasis who move to uh, the modern uh, to to uh, urban cities, but they cannot get away from that poverty cycle because uh, they go, don't get proper jobs. Their children have to work, and um, th this is uh, this is the country basically says uh, this this development is for you and for your group, so you don't have to worry about uh, these these people. Um, so. Uh, uh, another uh, uh, so Sam uses instances uh, like this basically to mirror um, how men with power subjugate people to harassment, and also the concept of social hierarchy and how uh, uh, I, like an allegory for for the government and uh, the people, the officials who can do whatever they please because of the power structure, and nobody can question uh, question them really because, um, like I said, the power structure. Uh, now. Um, the government projects this idea of development and global progression through a very sensationalized narrative um, by saying, you know, we are catching up with the West and we are trying to modernize our, ourselves and not live in this backward, undeveloped um, mindset. Uh, and with their blatant sense of obnoxious ignorance and, um, and their farce is basically covered in this veil of uh, Western development. And anyone who questions their authority or, or criticizes them are deemed as anti-national. Uh, and a lot of the masses in, in India uh, are 
constantly blindsided usually uh, towards this injustice it's because the media projects and usually portrays a very government uh, biased government sanctioned viewpoint and um, and they also have these false promises of resettlement and uh, blatant lies and ignorance towards them and the to and basically so you see that the total annihilation of this of the cultural identity of the adivasis it doesn't seem like um, uh, it's an unthought consequence. Basically, they, they feel like it just rather feels like it's willfully ignored by the political leaders because um, they have because they j don't mean they don't have any value to them and they are only there to benefit their financial profits. Um, <clears throat> here, here is uh, other examples of how um, the officials and the government disregards, threatens, and manipulates uh, manipulate their narratives in order to get away with what they want. You can see an instance over here where they say that uh, even if you add another lakh of people to be displaced by the irrigation connection, it doesn't um, compare to what uh, benefits uh, that it happens. So basically, these the communities that get um, destroyed by uh, these development projects, they kind of become these casualties of war, like it's for the greater good. And um, they create wrong narratives and, and use their power to, um, to st uh, stifle them. <clears throat> the novel is littered with of these instances, like calling the Adivasis ignorant and dismissing the ideology and believing how they are one with nature. And even saying that if development has to be done, it is justified because it is for the betterment of the of the rest of uh, the people. There are other instances of power structure depicted in Sen's novel, uh, where um, the the he showcases how the government officials effectively take away their lands and their livelihoods, and they also introduce them to these vices, uh, for the, the modern vices into their community, like alcoholism and gambling, which uh, results in dispersion and separation. And because of this, their culture is essentially lost, and they, it's it can never be like recovered again. Um, then, of course, it, oh my, I'm so sorry. Um, yes. So, in the name of uh, development, those in power uh, resort to very ruthless means of achieving their goals. Uh, they could sometimes they cause harm to the Adivasi communities. Sometimes even very uh, fatally. While talking to Orijit Sen, uh, he even mentioned that he has himself seen a lot of violence and even deaths while he was um, staying with these communities and protesting with them. Um, and it's the indigenous communities of India are not victims of just verbal oppression and violence, but they are often brought into line through very uh, violent means. Um, and Shen, Sen depicts this through his novel very uh, blatantly. <clears throat> so uh, destruction in the name of development. Now this again is portrayed in how he portrays it in the in his graphic novel. So like I spoke about the mental divide before, like this mental divide justifies the destruction of the Adivasis, like I said, because of the greater good. And it also justifies the violence. Uh, and if and whoever tries to um, uh, question them or stand in their way, violence is justified because it is for, uh, for the so-called greater good. And under this facade of civilizing uh, uh, the Adivasi communities, those in power have tried to um, like snatch away and strip away their resources and essentially their identity and their complete collective reason for existence. Um, this project of the Sadar Sarovar Dam came uh, to light even in, the, even in the graphic novel only after the publication of um, this uh, journalist interview where, where he the project people came to know that the project would inundate 37 hectares of the forest land, which didn't just affect the lives of the people living there, but would also submerge these temples and and um, towns. So while the government, with the government promising... Oh, yeah, could that, you conclude your Yes, paper I'll, I'll, read soon. I'll read on soon. Um, with the government promising these ideas of modernizing, they've completely disregarded environmental and cultural destruction. So this is like... Despite these fights, despite everything happening, the dam was eventually built. It displaced 41,000 families, and out of that, 56% of them were the Adivasi communities. So to conclude, I would like to say that India has seen uh, many such uh, 
protests in the name of human rights as well as environment. And uh, the course of these protests have grown to ask the very hard hitting question, development, yes, but at what cost? It is important to know that the loss of the culture of indigenous people and other minority groups play a very pivotal role in cultural anthropology because it represents this irreversible loss of human heritage and diversity. Um, under this garb of development, and uh, governments and private organizations have found their actions to be justifiable, snatching away their land. And with these empty promises from these people stealing their land, these um, communities and uh, have to watch their future and their culture be destroyed for the modern development, uh, for the benefit of the, the very privileged few. And um, India is this country filled with this plethora of unique and beautiful uh, identities and cultures. And despite this image of this cultural diverse land, we are in fact uh, a nation that is in conflict with its own people. Uh, because it, in this idea of development, it's doing nothing for the ancient indigenous cultures. And in fact, they even dominate and threaten them. Uh, uh, so through his novel, Orijit Sen uh, captures these horrifying truths of the modern side, the, the, the ugly side of modern development through different voices and points of views. Uh, before I end, I would like to like, finish this with a question uh, asking uh, everyone else, can modernization really be considered as development if it can only be achieved through the destruction of those less fortunate? Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Zoya. Uh, Zoya. Uh, I think uh, I have some <clears throat> questions and comments, but I, I would uh, really I'm leave just, it to... Uh, I just want to say one thing that uh, we are already late by 12 minutes. Do you, you, you have another morning. session now? Yeah, the chair for the next session is already waiting. So if OK, just... so I think we'll have to wrap up. I mean, I will just uh, say two things. I, I enjoyed all the presentations, uh, perhaps some more than others. Uh, I would also say that, Zoya, you packed a lot in a short space of time. And I'm sure you enjoyed meeting Orijit, who's a wonderful guy. I did. Um, but did you meet him in Goa? No, unfortunately, he wasn't in Goa at the time. Uh, but I did get to talk to him over the phone, and he provided a lot of insights. And he told me some really sad. Okay, apart from reading the River of Stories and talking to Orijit, have you been to the Narbada? Unfortunately, not. I haven't. I this haven't is the important, this is the critical thing between I, theory and practice. Yes. You must, because I believe in this one thing I believe in theory. But I believe an ounce of practice is more than a ton of theory. So I would urge you to visit the Narmada. There are many sides to the story. It's not just one sided. Yes, I, I and, would love uh, to find the opportunity. And it's very I would love nuanced. It. It's not just us and them, black and white. Sometimes it's very grim. Sometimes yes. it's very difficult. Because there's another guy, group called Anil Patel, I think Anil Patel, and his group who are for the time. They were with the Narmada Vachar and Dalumbate separated because they said uh, people need to be uh, rehabilitated. Anyway, thank you all for this uh, wonderful uh, set of presentations. And uh, I hope I wish you all well. And I thank Janki Devi College and its the organizers for this uh, opportunity to speak and share. And thank you, Ankan, for being such a good timekeeper. And I'll just shut up and say goodbye and hand it yes, over sir. to the. But can we just John have Kerr. you and the uh, presenters open their uh, videos for a minute? Just one quick picture. Just 10 seconds. All the presenters. The presenters are so having a problem with their video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, sir, for coming here and joining with us. And thank you all the presenters for sharing your work with us. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, uh, everybody. All the best. Team, you can stop the recording for this session. Uh, I'm very sorry, Pauri.